either you didn't know the hymn or you're reluctant to make that commitment. <laughs> that was the hymn that Bishop Short chose to sing on the day that I was ordained. The only problem is I don't believe the cabinet always consulted with God before they told me where to go. I think they sent me to Nineveh when God wanted me to go to Rome. <laughs> A number of you asked for copies of the introspection on John Wesley. I am extremely flattered by the interest that you showed in that. And as I explained to some of you, when I put the tape recorder in my pocket, I uh, accidentally turned it from record to play, and therefore we got nothing. But my absence on the 23rd is because the philosopher's class has asked me to do the introspection for them, which I will be doing. But more than that, some of you suggested that instead of speaking about the Wesleyan hymns, around which the introspective was woven, how wonderful it would be if Carlene were to sing those hymns, because they are reasonably unfamiliar hymns. I've been asked to preach at Colonial Heights Church in Kingsport on the evening of the day that I do the introspection here on March the 17th. And I said, why work up a sermon when I've got an introspection that I can use Carlene because she won't be tied up at St. John's. And I plan to do the introspection there with Carlene doing the singing. That will be recorded, and for those of you who asked for the other, and any others, that tape then will be available to you. So that will write my misadventures in not taping previously. And one more thing, a couple of weeks ago, Elaine Curtis, when we have questions, she asked, I saw the word Episcopal on the Methodist Church. Could you explain that? And my family knows that when you ask me to explain something, I don't just explain what is being asked. I go all the way through the forest to get there, <laughs> which I did. <laughs> and uh, as a result, uh, Lewis Wexler said, could I have a copy of that tape? He said, I didn't know these things about the Methodist Church. More than that, Jim Gibson said, said, Vance, I learned some things about the Methodist Church in that brief presentation that I didn't know. Would you write a brief history of the church? And I'll underwrite the cost of getting it done. I took him seriously. And the manuscript is complete. Now, I struggled to keep it brief. He said we want it brief and simple. <laughs> and you can imagine the difficulty that I had in there. Well, I got the bill, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Only then will we know how brief the prayer was. <laughs> <laughs> it's now on my yellow scratch pad. And uh, Carlene has agreed to type it off on the computer. And... Uh, Pretty expensive. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's not going to be anything other than just uh, a nice pamphlet. Uh, we'll do it on desktop publishing so there'll be no cost to it. But I'm going to have enough copies for each of you to have. And so in two or three weeks, while well, that will be ready for you. And hopefully it will uh, answer some of the questions that you have not asked, but others have. That's probably the only good suggestion I've made in the last 25 years. <laughs> Wait till you see the manuscript. <laughs> the opening line, and I'll give you the opening line of the manuscript right now. The opening line is, the Methodist Church had its birth at Pentecost in Jerusalem the year that Jesus died. There's a long way from then down to the present, but it's, it's a brief passage, so uh, you can anticipate that. But today we've got to deal with Jonah. Jonah is really the 
accompanying <laughs> lesson to the last two lessons that we've had on the same subject that was trying to be expressed by the writer of both. It's a story of a man and a fish. Now that's what many people think. Shortly after my graduation from seminary, I was appointed to the church at Madisonville. And a member of that church was Judge Sue K. Hicks. Judge Hicks was retired from the bench at that time. Incidentally, he had made a presentation at a legal convention in Gatlinburg. And Johnny Cash was the entertainment at that convention. And after being introduced as uh, Judge Sue K. Hicks, Shortly thereafter, there came out a song, A Boy Named Sue. <laughs> but the main thing about Sue K. Hicks is he was the assistant district attorney for the Scopes trial in Dayton. I learned firsthand all about the trial, and you can discount everything that anybody says about that. According to him, it was a joke that they all just worked up at a table for having coffee. Things were slow, and they said, let's get a little excitement going. Let's go down here and bring a suit against John T. Scopes. And they approached him, and he agreed. Yes, he would be agreeable to that. And then they sent a notice to the newspaper in Chattanooga to stir up a little interest. <laughs> and it went from there, as you well know. But Williams Jennings Bryan came to Dayton in order to support the litigation against John T. Scopes, while Clarence Darrow came from Chicago to take the side of Scopes himself. Judge Hicks said, we pled with Williams Jennings Bryan, please do not get on the witness stand. But he was insistent on doing it. And he said, Clarence Darrow just slashed him to pieces on the witness stand. And when he left the witness seat, he was a broken man. Many said he died of a broken heart. It was just about 10 days later that he died. But people who live in Dayton said he died from overeating. <laughs> he was a big eater and he developed a gastronomical problem. And out of that, he died. But that's neither here nor there. The point is that Clarence Darrow asked some very pointed questions, one of which was, do you believe that Jonah was swallowed by a whale? And Williams Jennings Bryan said that he did. And Darrow asked in turn, can you tell me any whale anywhere that is capable of swallowing a man? And Bryan answered, the God who created the world can create a fish big enough to swallow a man. We can't get our attention away from the man and the fish that swallowed him in the story of Jonah. And that comes to everyone's mind when we talk about Jonah. Immediately we think of the whale. But this morning I want us to... I'll start to kill the whale, but let's don't kill the whale. <laughs> let's just drag him out into a, another sea and forget about the whale altogether. Because this is one of the most dynamic books in the Old Testament. It is filled with great theological impact. If we'll only allow that to surface and forget all about the whale, because that becomes such a controversial thing that we lose sight of what the book is all about. A prophet by the name of Jonah lived in the 8th century. His name is listed in the second book of Kings, the 15th chapter and the 24th verse, which gives a time frame for which the story takes place, the 8th century. In the 8th century, Assyria was the strongest nation on earth, and it was the most violent nation, and many say that it was the most aggressive nation that has ever existed forcing its will upon all the nations, battling anyone who was not in battle, pillaging and destroying and taking away everything as the fruits of war. It was a hated nation above all nations. The capital of Assyria was Nineveh on the Tigris River. And so it was to this nation 
that Jonah awakened one day with the voice of God saying to him, I want you to go to the most hated nation on earth. And I want you to say to them that if they do not turn to me, that I will destroy them. Now, Jonah loved those last words. I'm going to destroy them. But he didn't like the first words in saying, you can turn to me. How was he going to go to a nation that he hated so greatly and try to convert them so that they will be spared annihilation? And so he couldn't bring himself to go. And not being willing to obey God, he said, the best thing I can do is to escape him, get away from God. Now, in the primitive understanding of God at this time in history, God was the God of Israel. If you could get out of Israel, then you could get away from God. Remember how they wept in Babylon because they couldn't worship. They were in a strange land. How can we worship God in a strange land? Well, Noah discovered that before the children of Judah did when they went into Babylon. Get away from him, then we won't have to do what he told me to do. So he went down to Joppa to the seaport and caught a boat that was going to go to Tarshish. How far can you get away from God? Well, Jonah chose the spot that was furthest that could be reached, and that was in Spain on the other end of the continent. And the boat was headed for Spain, Tarshish, and he was to be aboard. And so he crept aboard, hoping that he could slip away before God could find him hiding. But God knew where he was, and he didn't let him get away with it. A storm arose on the sea. Everybody was fearful. Everybody was awake, frightened, but Jonah, and he was asleep. Now, why he slept while others feared is unimaginable, but he slept, thinking that he had escaped God. And they awakened him and said, we're in danger of dying. We've got to do something to save ourselves. And so they said, someone aboard this ship has brought the wrath of God upon this ship. We need to find out who that person is. Jonah kept quiet, as did all the others. So they cast lots. Casting lots was a method used by determining the truth. It was used in choosing the 12th disciple to... Uh, replace the one that had betrayed Christ. John Wesley used it repeatedly when decisions became hard for him to make. They cast lots to see which among them might be the guilty party, and the guilt felt on Jonah. And so Jonah said, I'm the one who has caused the storm to come. God has sent me on a mission, and I have refused to go. And they said, well, what can we do? And he said, throw me overboard. The entire ship's crew were reluctant to take the life of Jonah to save their own. Speak so highly of those in whose company he had found refuge. But after they tried to row back to shore and couldn't do it, and they saw that all of them were going to perish, they apologized to Jonah and apologized to God and said, the only thing we can do now is to get rid of the one who has brought your wrath upon the ship. And they threw him overboard. And then immediately the storm subsided. They went on their way. Jonah was trapped. Three days later, he found himself lying upon the beach now, with the assignment still ahead of him, he had to go to Nineveh. Next week's lesson is what happens after he awakened on the beach for the rest of the book of Jonah. So our concern today is that which transpired from the time that God said to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and warn them that if they do not turn from their wicked ways, that they will be destroyed. God calls each of us at times for individual missions. Nothing dramatic necessarily <clears throat> like Jonah, but that's how God works. When we pray, 
our prayer ought to be in addition to the request that we make and let be be the instrument by which this can be done. Because the great miracles of God are wrought through people, not apart from people. The medical profession is a great profession. It is God's arm of healing. And when people are healed by doctors, they take it in stride. If the healing comes without the doctor, they say it's a miracle. They've lost sight of the whole thing. God has put miracle in the hands of doctors so that they can perform those things that answer the prayers of people. The same thing with teachers and other professions. These are means by which God brings his miracles to fruition. The problem is that so many of us are deaf to God's call when he calls us to do special things. To be sensitive to the fact that God might be able to use you for a particular need of someone else is true discipleship. As John Kennedy said, don't ask what God can do for you, but ask what you can do for God. But on the part of many of us, we would rather escape God than to face up to God. And so we do. We lose ourselves in many interests. So many lose their interest in the church because the church is a, a compelling organization that forces them to face up to who they are and their responsibilities. But to be out in the world and enjoying the things of the world, we can soon forget that God is a part of it at all. Mike asked me the other day, he comes home for lunch since I'm at home alone for lunch and he leaves his office just a few blocks away and we have lunch together. On Friday, he said, Dad, would you like to live on a farm? I said, I'd love to live on a farm if I've got somebody to do all the work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be a farmer. I've had aunts and uncles who were farmers and they depended too much upon the rain and the sunshine and the drought and the anxiety of where the crops would die in the field. That's a hard life. Even if it comes through at harvest time, the labor that goes into bringing it, that's a hard life. We find ways in which we can serve God that are appealing to us more than we seek to find ways to serve God that's appealing to Him. God can use us, whoever we are, wherever we are, if we are attentive. But simply to ignore the needs that we can be a part of the solution is a way to hide from God and what He wants us to do. What appears to be a trap we can't escape God, is really a blessing and a boon to every one of us. If we can't escape God, that means that whenever that moment comes in life that we need God, we don't have to say, I wonder where he can be found. Because he hasn't left us as he didn't leave Jonah. Where can I escape God to the heavens? to make my bed in Hades, to the wings of the morning, to the uttermost parts of the sea? We can't because he's everywhere. One of the most beautiful pieces of literature was written by Francis Thompson. He wrote The Hound of Heaven. Most of you, I'm sure, read that in college or have read it at one time or another. It's a beautiful telling of a story that happened to a man in his youth, his father, who was a physician, wanted him to be a physician like himself. And he and Francis' mother saved almost to the point of depriving themselves of their own necessities in order to give him a medical education. For eight years, he attended school and he flunked every one of those eight years. He enjoyed the pleasures of life too much. <clears throat> he wanted to have the vocation fulfilled, but he didn't want to pay the price that uh, would be required for him to become a physician. And finally, the day came when the father confronted Francis and said, we can't support you any longer. 
You've used up all of our savings. We have nothing with which we can send you to school. Francis was wobbly in his behavior, slurred in his speech, and his father asked him point blank, have you been drinking? And Francis answered no. And he answered correctly. He wasn't drinking. He was on opium. He had been for years. Before his mother died, she had given him a book on the experience of opium written by someone who talked about the elevated senses that came with the use of opium. And Francis decided that he would try it. But the problem was he became addicted. He had spent most of the money that his parents had given him for opium and living with opium dealers. Now he was on his own. Addicted to opium, no way of earning a living, turned out financially by his family, the only place he could go was to the slums of London. He lived on the banks of the Thames along with the other homeless people. He earned money whatever way he could. He had no skills to sell, and so they were just menial tasks by which he could get enough money to feed his opium, his opium habit. He wrote his experiences on pieces of paper wherever he could find them. Told about the prostitute who had compassion on him and from time to time would take him to her home and feed him and give him a place to sleep before he went out to sleep huddled up in a dark place. Told about a shoemaker who tapped him on the shoulder one day and said, is your soul at peace with God? And he turned with anger and said, it's none of your business. And the man said, well, if you won't let me feed your soul, let me feed your body. And he took him into his home and fed him and gave him new clothes, gave him some money and sent him on his way. It was experiences like those that kept him in touch with humanity. But beyond that, he was totally lost. Then one day on the desk of a publisher in London, a man by the name of Meinl, he opened up a piece of torn and soiled paper package to find a manuscript of just pieces of paper thrown together, whatever kind of paper could have been found on which could be scribbled with the stub of a pencil. He started to throw it away and a few of the words caught his attention because of the beauty of expression and he laid it out on his table and when he had finished, he was so moved by the beauty that he said, we've got to find the person who wrote this. He had left the return address on the package and they wrote a letter to that address. It was general delivery, but nobody ever came to claim it. So he decided the best way to find out who has written this beautiful literature is to publish it. And publish it, he did. It was published under the title, The Hound of Heaven. After it had been published, one day, a disheveled young man in his late twenties stumbled up to the door, entered in, and with impatience, he was asked to leave. But then suddenly they realized that there was something intense about the young man. And though, so they asked why he was there. And he told them that he was Francis Thompson that he had written The Hound of Heaven. So Mr. Meinl took him into his own home because of the beauty of the literature, nursed him back to health as best he could, weaned him off his habit, gave him clothes, a place to sleep and food until he was restored to something of his former self, though he was a broken man because of the years of the abuse of drugs. In the course of that time, he wrote many beautiful pieces of poetry, none to match the one. I fled him down the days and down the nights. I fled him down the arches of the years and in the labyrinthian ways of my own mind. And in the misty silence, I hid from him. On his death, which came only 20 years later because of his dissipated youth, at the age of 47, he died. On his casket was laid a group of flowers, a bouquet of roses, a handwritten known by George Eliot that said to a true poet, a member of a group of so few. Mrs. Meinl, who had taken him as her own son, laid violets upon his breast and he was laid to rest. But the life that he lived revealed 
such a tremendous truth. God is the hound of heaven. He goes everywhere we go. He stays always at our side. And whenever we're willing to turn, we see him face to face. What was a negative factor to Jonah? He couldn't escape God. Becomes a positive affirmation for us. No, we can't. And when we need him, he's there. I've got a clock now. <laughs> I can't apologize for running over. Are there any comments or questions on anything that we've talked about? I haven't sparked your curiosity at all, have I? No, you had a spell there. <laughs> Did you start to ask something? Well, how does God perceive who we should go after? Do you bring that or do you ever just let somebody go? I mean, do you have this mind? Do you know all the stories of people? How would he know to go after somebody? Somebody could shut him down. How does he know? God knows us all. Uh, why he chose Jonah for that particular mission, there's no inference at all in the book. Incidentally, this is the only book in the Bible about an individual prophet. All the other books are books that prophets tell, but this was about the prophet himself became the prophecy. Uh, many instances that were never told. The reason that the book of Jonah was written was written in the 8th century when the book of Kings gave him a date for his life. It was written after the exile and the people of Israel had gone back to Israel or to Judah. And they found everyone who had remained behind, many of whom had intermarried, brought in other nations. There was a discrimination beyond imagination between the Jewish people and other people. God had said while they were in exile, you are to be a light to all nations. The truth that had been brought to the Hebrew people what now was to be spread to all people everywhere. It was a universal gospel. And here they were being pressed back into the mold of we're the only ones. God hates everybody that's not like us. And they were destroying families. The book of Ruth was written to say, hey, wait a minute. David had a great grandmother who was a Moabite. How can you say that God hates everybody that isn't Jewish? That was the purpose of the book of Ruth. The book of Job was to say as hated as the Assyrians are, as terrible as their behavior is, God loves them. And he wants them to turn from their ways and accept his promises and his salvation. So that was the purpose for the book was to say to the people having returned to Judah, open up your minds to other people. God loves us all. That's the purpose of the book. I lifted out some theological principles that I thought were more contemporary for our help. Can't stand somebody because of what they do or what they've done. And you push them up their minds. <laughs> Is that how you want to interpret? I don't want to. <laughs> I got. It's hard. And that's why I'm saying, are we turning away from God and not doing what I was sent to church once where my dear friend Charles Lehman said, God must have a great task ahead for you to put you through a period of testing. <laughs> it's no fun. My contention is God does not ask anyone to do something that he doesn't get great joy in doing. We aren't all alike. Read in the call last week a disturbing article on the young man who spoke at, at Resurrection and it created a lot of controversy. And he said, and I hope I'm not misquoting him, he makes his own clothes He's a dropout, lives with the homeless. And the question was asked, what about us? He said, everybody doesn't need to make his own clothes. 
But you shouldn't buy new clothes. You should go to places where clothing is recycled and buy clothes that others have used. Well, if everybody did that, he'd make the clothes that are going to be worn to be given to places that can be recycled. Now, if he wants to wear homemade clothes and live with homeless people, maybe God called him to do that and he gets great pleasure from it and he will fulfill a great mission. But God didn't call everybody to do that. He calls us to do things that are consistent with our own personality, with who we are. He calls some people to move in in elite social circles because they are in a position to influence and affect those people. So God's love is for everyone individually. Poverty is not an asset to God. Poverty is a terrible thing. Out of poverty, many times we meet God because we're deprived of the things that we otherwise would allow us to escape God. But to become poverty-stricken, to take a vow of celibacy, to take a vow of poverty, these are things that individuals may be called upon to do, but not. I love St. Francis. I love my wife. He can be a celibate if he wants to. I'm not called to be St. Francis, but there are many attributes of St. Francis that are inspiring to me. And I can. I don't think God has ever called me to do anything that I didn't get great satisfaction in doing. But I've never done anything that normally would bring great dissatisfaction either. So maybe I have resisted God's call. I don't know. But the fact is, each of us is called by God on the basis of our gifts, of who we are, what we're capable of doing. A man with an IQ of 65 is not going to be called to teach on a university campus. A man who can't use his fingers is not going to be called to be a surgeon. So God uses us and calls us individually. And one pattern doesn't fit everybody. And I ran over after all. <laughs> Wisdom 